In the early morning of September the 15th, 1916, a strange sound came out of the fog, floating along the Somme River. It was a growing monotonous rumble, accompanied by metallic clanging. The sound grew until, finally, gigantic shapeless silhouettes resembling mythical monsters emerged from the fog. These seemingly unstoppable monsters advanced ceaselessly into the German trench defensive positions, spitting fire and crushing everything in their path. In the German trenches in World War I, this guy's reaction must have been typical to the sight of this huge metal monstrosity slithering its way unstoppably across the battlefield with the common question, what is it? This incredible beast is the first ever combat tank. It is the Mark I and the last remaining Mark I in the entire world, doing exactly what it's designed to do, break through the defenses of the enemy lines. And when you come to the Tank Museum in Bovington, this is one of the first things you see and it sets the stage for the next hundred years of the tank. It all started with an odd partnership between an expert in agricultural machinery and a Royal Navy Air Service engineer. Triton and Wilson were attempting to solve a very practical problem, how to break the trench stalemate that had frozen the Great War for years. It occurred to them to use the common farm tractor as a base. They turned the tractor around, back to front. The engine was moved to the center of the vehicle and the hull was covered with a sheet of steel. Thus was born Little Willie, the first tank. So we are now surrounded by the first generation of tanks. We've got the Mark II, the Whippet and the Renault FT-17. But taking pride of place in the middle, Little Willie. The progenitor of them all, the first demonstrated to be somewhat successful tank. And I do say somewhat successful. A result of the Landship Committee formed by Sir Winston Churchill which being a naval organization led to all the naval terms you associate with a tank today, like the bow, the hatch, the sponson, and so on. But there were problems with Little Willie, and the main issue, and why we never saw it past this, was the tracks. It wasn't fit for purpose. The tracks just couldn't cope with what it was designed for, crossing these obstacles. No, in terms of the soft ground, the tracks worked fine, but when you got to the trenches, it couldn't do it which is what led then to the rhombus design, which we commonly associate with World War I tanks today. The machine adopted a long diamond-shaped hull to better accomplish its primary goal, breaching and crossing trenches. The idler wheels on the vehicle were lifted up as high as possible and prevented the tank from creeping down the trench, while the sprocket wheels were put as far back and low as possible. In the end, what emerged were small, land-based ironclad battleships equipped with casemate weapons, the first tanks deployed in battle. We're now outside with this incredible replica of the Mark IV, and the first thing you notice is it's not a quick vehicle. No, this is combat speed, about six kilometers an hour, four miles an hour. But if you're looking at it from the viewer's perspective as a German, you see this thing inexorably coming towards you, spitting fire from the guns. This is a significant emotional event. It must have been absolutely terrifying. What it does give to us, though, is a great outline of the rhomboid shape, of course, allowing it to go over obstacles much easier. Trenches, mar uh, barbed wire, that sort of thing. You got shortened six-pounders. Uh, not as long as the earlier ones in the Mark I. And a Lewis gun on the other side here on the Sponson. And of course the other differences between this, the Mark IV and the Mark I, was the armour. Uh, greatly improved over the Mark I. Not that it'll stop much except small arms still, but a better chance. The Sponsons you'll see will actually slide in for rail transport. And the other biggest difference of course was the engine on the Mark IV as opposed to the Mark I. Which is relocated, but to see that we got to go inside. So here we are in the Mark IV, right in the front of the vehicle and in the commander's and the driver's positions. Right, you call it the driver and that's because he does have access to the gear lever. He's got the brake, he's got the clutch and the accelerator and retard levers. Now that said, he doesn't have any steering controls, which is a bit of an issue for a driver. And really steering of the Mark IV was an issue anyway. At stages there were up to four of the crew, that's half of the crew involved in steering the vehicle, which is unbelievable. And that's because across on the commander's side, so the commander was also the assistant driver. I've got two steering brake levers left and right of me here. And I was also the bow gunner. So a busy man, the commander. Down to having a little, little hole there for shooting your revolver out of as you cross over trenches, if the tank wasn't enough. The armor was 10 to 12 millimeters thick. It was enough to withstand small arms fire, but not much more. 
Even with this, the vision slits were still vulnerable and injuries from shattered bullets were quite common. So we move now to the main crew compartment and very obviously in the middle, exposed to all the burn themselves on, the 105 horsepower engine. And just behind this engine, right to the rear of the tank, we've also got the transmission. Now, can you imagine, Nick, the problems of having this engine where it is? I mean, first of all, communication, the sheer noise of it must have been awful for the crew. And then you've got the, also the darkness because it wouldn't have these camera lights. You've got the noise. The commander would have had a hell of a time. And now a tank is not a tank without a gun, of course. And across here, we've got the first of our two six-pounders. Uh, the ammunition, as you see, is stowed pretty much everywhere around the tank and for the purposes of the demonstration, we'll give a round to the gunner here. So taking this round, putting it onto the loading platform, unfortunately I'm not allowed to push it all the way forwards, close the breech, uh, optical science system on top, very good science system, times two magnification and fire the gun. Despite the fact that five out of 32 tanks got stuck and nine broke down during the initial attacks, the remaining vehicles were able to fully demonstrate the potential of this new weapon. The attack on the 15th of September 1916 along the Somme was the birth of a new era. By the end of World War II, tanks played an integral role on the battlefield. And that was only the beginning for the triumphant progress of tracked combat vehicles through history.